Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Hello, <clears throat> how are you? Can you hear me properly? Yes, sir. Yes, sir, we can hear you. Okay, great. Uh, so we will begin shortly. Uh, I think we still have uh, I mean, 17 students, 16 students here. Okay, we will, we will start shortly. So let me share a few things. Okay, can you see my screen? Yes, sir. Okay, great. Uh, so, hello everyone once again, and thank you very much for this class uh, coming on time. Uh, my name is Shahid Hussain. I I uh, I will be joining IBA as a full time faculty member from next week, and uh, I have been teaching at Habib University for a few five years, and uh, now I will switch to IBA. And um, so this is some uh, small logistical information required for this course. So I hope that uh, we will be able to finish and start this course uh, in, in time and everything. So a little bit about myself. So uh, <clears throat> my name, as I said, my name is Shahid Hussain and uh, I, I have uh, a PhD in computer science in especially theoretical computer science and my uh, area of research interest include uh, theory, combinatorial optimization, discrete maths, discrete applied maths, um, and, and very closely related other areas of computer science. And I have been teaching uh, such courses like theory of automata uh, with other names, but I've been teaching such courses like theory of automata and algorithms and other courses uh, for quite some time actually. So, so my teaching experience is like more than 10 years. Uh, actually, it's, it's, it's a bit more than 10 years and um, I've been teaching mainly uh, such theoretical courses, including um, theory of automata, algorithms, uh, discrete mathematics, and some combinatorial optimization related courses, uh, and some other uh, courses like graph theory and, and theoretical computer science. So uh, I'll be teaching this course, um, Theory of Automata, CS CSE 309. And uh, I, I believe this is a summer course. So summer courses are a little bit unusual um, for any university, any school. So it's, it's, it's a bit compressed. I think it's, it's uh, we, we actually have half time available uh, then as compared to the uh, regular semester. Uh, so therefore we have, uh, I mean, a bit longer classes and, and more classes per week. So rather than having three classes for one hour and maybe 15 minutes, we have three classes for two hours and 15 minutes. And um, yeah, so we will rush and it, it's, it's uh, and, and I mean, yeah, there are a lot of things in this course that we, we have to do. Okay, so I'm not sure how many students are uh, currently enrolled in this class. I think around 40 students, maybe more. Uh, I think most of them are here, <clears throat> which is good. And uh, anyway, so we will see that how it uh, goes on. Uh, so our classes will be three days on Tuesdays, Thursdays, and Saturdays. Uh, are you taking the class online or are you physically present at campus? Uh, can you repeat that question? <laughs> Sir, I'm seeing are you physically present on campus or are you uh, taking an online class? at home uh, right now i'm at home and i'll be taking classes from home for at least first week and from next week i'm not sure what is going to be the policy uh, but, but, but for the first week i will be uh, taking classes online. Um, sir, we... Hello, there's a lot of noise coming from your side 
no sir and say all i'm saying is uh, we did not know that so we were physically present at campus right now i cannot hear you there's a lot of noise coming from your side can you can you repeat that oh you are on campus <clears throat> okay yes sir oh okay that's fine uh, actually i was not sure about uh, what to uh, do and how to proceed with that so i asked uh, dr sajad and i was told that maybe it's it's okay if you take the class first class from home and and, and only online and maybe from second class or maybe probably from second week uh, we will decide that what is going to be the course of action uh, so today i am at home and a couple of students asked me about that and i told them uh, that i will be taking this class uh, completely online so even if you are on campus you can you can sit in some lab or some classroom and and, and you can use the internet from the iba uh, but th this is completely online so if things go smoothly and and uh, university says that we have to be Uh, present on uh, on campus then probably from next week uh, we will make our classes hybrid and uh, we will take these classes from uh, from campus so i hope it's not a, a big uh, i mean um, uh, issue for all of you if you are on campus then i'm sorry i was not able to communicate it communicate to all of you in time uh, but we will make it up right so uh, i believe that if you are on campus then probably you have uh, access to the better internet and maybe uh, uninterrupted power supply as well so maybe you can make most of it uh, but really i'm really sorry for that that I, i was not able to inform you in time uh, because things uh, were very rushed uh, actually i still haven't uh, joined iba uh, as as faculty because uh, there's still some time i would join it next week and um, so there are some logistical issues so so probably it's better that we start this class online and then we will continue from campus is that okay is that okay with all of you okay sir yes okay, yes sir yes sir okay, okay. Sir. great uh, so at any time if you have any questions please just let me know raise your hand either raise your hand or uh, just let me know and we will uh, I, i will stop and uh, we will try to answer your questions okay So um among all of you uh, is there anyone uh, who has taken this course before or is it new for all of you It's new for us Okay it's new for all of you for or most of you Okay that's fine um so maybe you have some idea about this course so, uh, so let me explain what this co co course is all about Uh, so this course theory of automata is usually um, taught in almost all undergraduate cs programs all, all around the world and uh, the name of this course differs from university to university so there are multiple possible names for this course so theory of automata is one name uh, there is another name which is called automata in formal languages sometimes it is called just called formal languages Uh, sometimes it is called theory of computer science sometimes it's called theory of computation sometimes it is called the nature of computation and and there are many other varieties and variations of of this uh, name uh, but what this course actually uh, tells us or what this course is about uh, it's it's about a very fundamental aspect of computation so we actually try to define what is computation so you are all cs students uh and you must have done some programming and some introduction to computer science and other similar courses so you might have some good idea about what is computer science what are the fields of computer science what are sub fields of computer science and what uh, what is the current research and, and and things like that uh but you might not have um asked this question to yourself or maybe to other people that what actually is computer science or what actually is computation so when we say that something is computable what does it mean Uh, so in this course we try to answer those questions that and we try to find out uh, what are the fundamental um, building blocks of computation so what is basically the simplest form of computation and what is the most complicated or most complex form of computation and what is that we can compute and what is that we cannot compute and if we can compute is it possible to improve uh, our ideas about, about computation is it possible uh to improve the efficiency of that uh, that computation process uh, or it is the ultimate utmost um, answer that we cannot improve our understanding about cer certain processes 
So this is, uh, this is the whole idea about this course. And this is a very theoretical course and mostly it is considered to be, I mean, uh, the most rigorous or theoretical course in the entire uh, CS curriculum at many places. Uh, this course together with the course on algorithms. Um, <clears throat> so, so there are some prerequisites for this course and those prerequisites are basically some understanding, simple understanding of computer science, uh, probably some knowledge of programming languages and in uh, discrete mathematics. So if you are coming to this course with uh, discrete mathematics background, then probably it will be easier for you to follow and, and proceed. Uh, otherwise, there might be some difficulties and, and problems which you might face. Uh, so from time to time, whenever we, uh, we come at a point where we, we have to uh, use the discrete mathematics from, uh, from your, from your pre previous semesters, uh, then I will provide you some uh, refresher uh, to that topic, uh, but it's always a good idea that you already, if, if you already know, because in that case, we will be uh, covering those topics very quickly. So discrete mathematics and some knowledge of computer science and programming are the prerequisite for this course. I'm not sure that how it works, how prerequisites work at IBA, so I will try to figure it out uh, formally, but since you are already enrolled in this course, then you must have uh, fulfilled the prerequisite requirements. Uh, so as I said that this is a theoretical course and discrete mathematics is required. So definitely we will be proving a lot of things. Uh, we will not be manipulating equations uh, or summations and things like that. Uh, but what we would be doing is, is the understanding of mathematical proofs. So, uh, so this course basically lies at the intersection of computer science with, with mathematics or with theory. So, so we will be doing and indulging ourselves in a lot of uh, proofs and theorems and lemmas and other similar things. And we will try to figure out that how to come up with a, a, a formal rigorous argument uh, by starting with an informal explanation or informal argument uh, of a proof. So in, in class, uh, sometimes we will, we will uh, do complete proofs. Sometimes I will just provide you an outline and, and leave the rest of the proofs as an ex either as an exercise, or I will refer you to some books uh, or, or the, uh, some article somewhere. And I would say that please read uh, the complete from, proof from there. And sometimes I would um, leave the full proof to you as an exercise. So, uh, <clears throat> so let's see. Uh, what are the learning out outcomes of this course? So by the end of this course, we want, uh, I, I want as an instructor uh, that you should be able to, uh, I mean, you will have these qualities and attributes. So you should be able to model computation tasks and an appropriate computational framework. So we would see that what is meant by a computational framework. And if, if, uh, if there's a framework, is it possible to have multiple frameworks? What are the differences in those uh, frameworks? What are the uh, relationship with these between these computational frameworks and so on. So we should be able to, to model computational problems in an appropriate computational framework. Uh, and we will also talk about the limitations of uh, on, on computation. So we might have some idea that maybe everything is computable, uh, but interestingly in this course, we will find that not everything is computable. And sometimes some things are computable, but they are too uh, difficult to compute that it's better not to compute. Sometimes it is impossible to compute some things. So we will see and, and classify those problems into different categories and we will see that. Um, so, so we will talk about uh, these limitations in, in a very formal and rigorous setting. Uh, <clears throat> so we would also talk about and think about this way that if you have um, a certain uh, computational uh, question that how we can come up with um, an argument to show that uh, there exists a solution for that. Uh, there exists a computational solution for that problem. And we would also, um, I mean, uh, we will, so, there, so if we can divide this course basically in three parts. So the first part is about computation and the second part is about the complexity and the third part is about the uh, limitation of complexity, a limitation of computation. So, so you should also be able to know uh, what are the simple uh, in basic complexity classes how to classify problems into different classes and what is the difference between these classes, what are the relationship between these classes and so on. And, and, and the last one, we would look at some frontiers of theoretical computer science. Maybe we will see 
uh, how it started, how it all started in, in the beginning of the uh, 20th century and what is the state of art in the theory of computer science right now and what could be uh, possible future directions for theory of computer science. So uh, as a main text textbook for this course, we will be using Introduction to Theory of Computation by Michael Sipser. Uh, I would be using third edition. I, I think it is the latest edition, but if we find uh, a newer version, uh, we will try to uh, find it out. But I think third edition is available uh, online as well as uh, you can find it in book form uh, from Urdu Bazaar and other places. Uh, so we will be using Introduction to Theory of Computation by Michael Sipser. Michael Sipser is, is a professor at MIT who teaches uh, Theory of Computation and he's a professor of computer science. Uh, so there are other um, resources, other books and papers and other things which uh, you don't have to apply, you don't have to have them uh, all, all the time, uh, but sometimes I would refer to them and, and, and provide references and links. Uh, so we might be using some parts or some questions or some topics from Introduction to Automated Theory, Languages and Computation by this classical text by Hopcroft, Motwani and Ullman. Uh, we might um, uh, be using some parts from uh, the Feynman lectures on, on computation by Richard Feynman. And there are uh, two other resources which are not directly connected with, uh, with this course, but they provide a deeper, uh, I mean, connection to theory of computer science and people and, and then how uh, people in theoretical computer science think and, and, uh, and do their uh, research and other things. And if at, at any point uh, we feel that uh, we need some more uh, resources, I will share those resources with you. They are either, either give you the references or share the resources with you. Uh, grading procedure will be as follows. So you have to be very careful about it. So on the right hand side, we have this grading scale. Uh, so I will compute the grades as A plus to F using this uh, scale. Uh, so I, I believe this is the standard scale at IBA. And if it is not, then I will try to figure out what is the standard and then I will update uh, the syllabus with that. Uh, but on the assessment in instruments at what are the things that we will be do doing in this, in this class. Uh, so we will be having four problem sets, each with 6% of the grade. We will be having four quizzes, each with 6%, and we will have two exams. Uh, right now, I'm not sure about how TA uh, thing will work. Uh, so probably we will have one or two TAs for this course. Uh, in that case, TAs will be grading um, mostly problem sets and maybe sometimes quizzes, and I will be grading exams. And exams, uh, we do not know a policy about exams right now that will they be on campus, uh, in person, or they will be online. So, so we will wait for the formal official policy and, and, and decide about it. Uh, so, but mainly we would have these four things uh, which are in your hands. So if you do well, you would definitely get a good grade. And there are 10%, which is about class participation. So uh, I, I would reserve these marks for myself. And I would see that, I mean, if you are attending all the classes, you're responding to, to the questions and you're attentive and uh, you are participating, then most, most probably you will get 10 out of 10 uh, and the reduction will start depending upon uh, uh, your level of engagement in the class. So if you are not engaged, you are not taking classes, you are not submitting things on time, uh, you're not take, uh, participating in discussion and you're not asking maybe questions, then, uh, then you will, I mean, you would have, you would see some reduction, but mostly I, I, try, I tend to give as much marks as possible in class participation. Uh, regarding the problem sets, um, the, there, there are four problem sets and the problem sets would be assigned. So there is a schedule I will tell you that when I would, uh, when, when I would release the problem set and when those problem sets are due. And um, what you have to do is that you are welcome to collaborate on problem sets, uh, but provided two conditions that you write up your own solution. So you have to submit your solution individually, even though you work uh, in group. Maybe you can work in a group of two or three or four, um, but you need to write up your own solution. You, but whenever you collaborate with other students in your class, then you need to write their names and, and the other sources that you, you, that you might have used to uh, find the solution. And you need to clearly mention that how much contribution was made by individuals. Uh, so if you do these two things, then, then it's fine and you will be graded on, on this problem set. So I, I want you to uh, collaborate uh, with each other. Uh, 
but don't, uh, I mean, it, it, the collaboration should be discussion level collaboration. It, it should not be like that one person writes the solution and shares the solution with everyone and, and, and you just copy. Please don't do that. Uh, you, sh you can discuss, you can talk about the problems and, um, and then you can submit your own solution. Yes, there's, uh, there's a hand raised. Uh, Salma, yes, please, um, what's your question? Sir, we'll have four quizzes or five quizzes. You will have uh, four quizzes. But in the quizzes section, it said that we will have five quizzes. Yes, so we will see. Okay, sir, okay, thank you. Okay. Maybe there is, okay, I, I, it, it could be due to two two things. I, either it's it's a typo. Or there's there's one thing that I decided to do, but then I might have changed. So let let me uh, let 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 us wait for that, and I will I will explain. Uh, so the exam, as I said, that we do not know the exam policy right now. So uh, we will wait for the official policy, and based on that policy, we might be uh, I mean required to conduct the exams in person on campus. And if that is the case, that's that's perfectly fine. And if, if you decide that the exam should be online, uh, that is also fine. So we will figure it out that what is the tradition and how it, it is done at IBM. Uh, exams will be, uh, I mean, yeah. So I think you you have been to through exams. So uh, late work and makeup policy since it's it's a summer semester and it's it's very compressed. So uh, we would not have any late policy, right? So you cannot submit any problem set or quiz, or I mean, there, there is no late submission and there's no make makeup uh, because all dates are, I mean, we will, they are all already uh, almost defined. So I have defined that we will have a quiz in this particular week and this particular week, uh, but I haven't yet told you that exactly on which day we will have the quiz. So with the consensus of the class, I would, uh, I, I would, uh, I mean, I would announce the time and, and date for the quizzes. And most probably the quizzes will be uh, either on the, on the first class of the week, first class of the week or, or the last class of the week. And um, there is no makeup for that. So, so we will we make sure that you attend the classes and you attend the quizzes. Yes, there is some question, Ibrahim. Sir, are you known to yes. do any sort of scaling or relative grading or is the... The, the chart that you showed, is that, a really, is that absolute grading? Yes, that's a very good question. Uh, uh, what, is, what, what I do actually is that I, I don't like relative grading. So, so I don't scale up, I don't scale down. So you get the grade that you, you get the grade, right? Uh, so for example, if you scored 99 out of 100, then you get 99 out of 100. And if it is the case that 50% uh, of the class got 90s, uh, 90, uh, 90 plus marks out of 100, that's perfectly fine. I'm okay with, with everyone or most of you getting A plus. So, so that's perfectly fine with me. So I don't scale down or scale up or curve. Uh, so your grade will be decided by your performance and not uh, because somebody did very well or somebody did very bad. So it's, it's, it's fixed, it's absolute. <clears throat> okay. Uh, will the quizzes have accumulated lecture specific lectures? Okay, that's that's a good question again. So usually quizzes, uh, since it's it's a it's a summer semester, and we, maybe you would have either four or five quizzes, and we have eight uh, weeks and two exams. So it's like almost every week we would have a quiz, and that quiz will be covering the topic that we covered in last week. So just that week, not before, right? So we would be specific to that one. That one week. Uh, again, the quizzes will be online or not, uh, all, I mean, on campus, I'm not sure. It all depends on the policy, university policy. Um, if the university says that it's, it's necessary for every student to be on campus, uh, in that case, we would have uh, in person on campus. But if the university says that it can be hybrid, uh, then we will come up with a mechanism which is suitable for all of you. Um, so we will wait and see that what is the policy. Probably it will be clear by next week. Okay. So I, I like to have quizzes which are easy to grade. I mean, so LMS is, is, a, is a good resource so we can put quizzes on LMS. Uh, there's another tool called HackerRank so we can use quizzes on HackerRank as well. 
uh, which are auto graded as well. So yeah, so I, I like that, but not all quizzes can be auto graded or I mean easy. So we will see. Yeah, so uh, I think uh, policy has been decided, but let's wait because I, I talked with, uh, with the chairperson and I was asked that maybe we can wait a little, little bit. <clears throat> Uh, then the attendance policy is the standard IBA policy. Uh, academic integrity is the, uh, I mean, specific IBA code of conduct and policy would apply. Uh, there is zero tolerance for plagiarism. There is zero tolerance for cheating. There is zero tolerance for collusion. Um, so most of the time, it's really hard to figure out that somebody colluded or there is a case of plagiarism. Uh, but sometimes it's very obvious. So, uh, so. Please do not uh, cheat. Please do not copy others' uh, solution. Please do not pollute. And the thing is that I, I, when I teach, then I usually try my. I usually try that I. I want to trust my students. So, so I, I don't want to police you. I don't want to. I mean, have a very strict policy about it. And I, I really want to trust you. So, for example, if you say that you have done it yourself then I would not be going and checking, yes, well, whether you did it yourself or not. So I would trust and, and, um, and, and I would assume that this is the case. So I want to trust you. I want to create this environment where we trust each other. And um, so, but that trust can only be earned if you uh, show respect and, and, and you do not pollute. So, and I think that's, that's important that you do not pollute and cheat because um, the learning only happens if you, if you put your efforts, right? So this is important that you 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 put your hundred hundred percent and 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 then see that what is the result. <laughs> okay, now I have a, a tentative course schedule here, and uh, so this is the week one. So this week one is mostly about I mean the first class is mostly about the syllabus and some introduction, and after some time we will start talking about the the content. Um, and maybe there, so the boundaries are not very, I mean, rigid. So it is possible that in some weeks uh, we will bring material from the next week or sometimes we will not be able to finish some material in a, in a week's time and, and we will push it to the next week. Uh, but we will try to make sure that we, I mean, we, we follow this schedule as much as possible, but it's not the final word, right? So it is possible that we might not be able to cover one topic or two, or it is also possible that we cover everything one week before the deadline or, or the last classes. Uh, but we will see that how, how the pace of the class uh, goes and, and how comfortable you are with my uh, teaching and how responsive you are to my questions and other things, right? Uh, so on, on the third column, you see notes and uh, there is this problem set one that goes out in the first week. Uh, so probably I would, uh, I would release it either today or tomorrow on, to LM, on LMS and um, uh, you will see it and you will have time uh, to work on it and it will be due next week, right? So usually I would make sure that the problem sets are due in the last class of the week. So even if I release it today, it will not be due until Saturday of the next week. So you will have one week plus maybe two or three days. Uh, similarly, our first quiz will be next week. Uh, right now, I have not decided that will it be on Tuesday or Thursday or um, uh, or, or Saturday. Uh, we can we can mutually agree on some time and we can fix it for uh, all of the weeks, all of the quizzes. So it, if you all agree, we can make it that the quiz is the first thing that we do in the week, uh, in, the, in the first class of the week. Uh, that is uh, on on uh, on Tuesday. So if, if that is the case, we can fix it. Otherwise we can fix some other date or we can make it flexible that sometimes it is uh, in, in, in the first class, sometimes it is in the second class. Um, so you can see that the exam one is coming very rapidly. It's in, in week three. Uh, so exam will contain everything that we have done in week one and week two, right? So, so everything that we cover in week one and week two, it will be in exam one. So in exam one, there is no problem set. Uh, due or release or anything, uh, but the problem set will be released next week, and we, when we uh, then we will have also have a quiz. Uh, then we have another quiz. Then we have exam two, which is in week number six. So exam two would be a comprehensive exam, 
uh, that is from week one till week five will be covered in, in exam two. And everything else that we would cover would be covered in quiz four, uh, the last quiz, right? Okay, now uh, as somebody mentioned in your class that I, I said five quizzes uh, somewhere in the syllabus. So the thing was, I usually give one extra quiz and then at the end, I just uh, discard one quiz with the lowest grade. Okay, so we, maybe I would introduce, introduce that one here as well and put fifth quiz somewhere or I would fix. So I, let me think about it. Uh, is there any way of contacting me outside the class in case we have a question? Uh, you have my email address, so you can send me an email and um, just send me an email and, and I will see that uh, what is the, uh, I mean, level of urgency in, in that email and I will respond accordingly. Uh, probably from next week, probably from Tuesday or Wednesday, I will be regular uh, on campus as well. Uh, so if I'm on campus, then I will share my office details and phone number and um, uh, office location and other things and uh, office hours as well. So if you are on campus uh, and you happen to be in, in the slot where I, I'm conducting the office hours, you can come and we can talk about things. Okay, is there uh, any other question? Uh, yes, sir? Uh, Yes. Is there any yes, N minus one policy for the problem set two? Uh, like problem the, set, like no, there's no N minus one for problem set. Uh, we might have uh, N minus one for quizzes, uh, but not for problem set. Okay, sir. All right. Thank you. Okay. And uh, I will figure out that how, what is the procedure of getting um, uh, some TAs? Um, and if we have TAs, then we might have a uh, easier time. And uh, it is also possible that we can have some recitations um, scheduled sometime. So uh, that would be open to all students and uh, not mandatory. So if you are on campus or online, so we can talk about your concerns. <clears throat> okay, so we can conduct those recitations after. Uh, but the issue is that it is a summer semester. So summer semesters are different and difficult. Uh, yeah, so if it, was a, if it was in a regular semester, we would have plenty of time. We would have 15 or 16 weeks rather than eight weeks. Uh, so we can spend and spread these topics uh, and, and we can be a little bit uh, lazy about it. Uh, but right now we do not have much options. <clears throat> Uh, can I change the time of the class? I think it's not in my hands, um, but if all of you are free at that time, uh, that I have no problem. So I will figure it out from uh, the coordinator and the chairperson that if it is possible, then maybe we would ask a registrar to reschedule it, um, but I'm not sure, okay? So if it is from five to seven, that's, that's, that's better. That's better for me. But it, it may be the case that some of you uh, are, are busy in some other courses. Uh, so we will see if it is possible to change the time. I, I would be glad to do that actually. Okay, is this thing clear? Is everything clear? Okay. Uh, the way I teach is that I usually do not like uh, teaching from slides. And I try to write on board, but since we are in online setting, so writing on board is uh, not an option. So what I would do, I would write on screen. Okay. And probably you would figure it out that it's okay. Just let me know if it is, if there is any issue. <clears throat> Okay, can you see my screen? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay, so I will yes, write over here. Yes.
So I would write over here and then I will also upload these notes as a PDF file on LMS. So you don't have to write everything that I write here. Uh, is that okay? Is that okay with all of you? Okay. So we have today is uh, Tuesday. Okay, <clears throat> so I have prepared slides, but I would not uh, use these slides. I, I mean, I would share these slides with you later on through uh, LMS, um, but uh, I will not show you these slides on screen right now. Okay, uh, so when you have these slides with you, you can you can use them. Okay, so let us start. Okay, in case of problem sets, in order to be well equipped to solve them, will we need to refer to just the lecture or the book or both of them? Um, book is enough, book is enough, uh, but lecture notes are, I mean, there are many things that, that, I mean, everything that we will do over here is mostly coming from the book, right? Uh, but sometimes I will explain um, in a different way. I would provide different examples which you will not find in, in book, for example, then, then it's better to refer to these notes. Uh, but for the most part, um, book is enough. Uh, will this course be entered person online till the end of the semester? I'm not sure. Uh, we will decide it after the end of this week and probably by next week, we will have a good um, uh, idea about it. So most probably it will be a hybrid of online and in-person on campus. Uh, so I'm not sure how it will go, but we, we will see that what is the policy, right? So it is also possible that this course could be 100% online, but I'm not sure. So it, it all depends on uh, IBS policy. <clears throat> okay, so, so the, usually the first question that I ask in this particular course is, what is a computer? Uh, I will try to find out that how to upload the recording, video recording of these lectures. So this has already been recorded. Uh, I will try to figure out that how to upload it because that's a huge file and I'm not sure that uh, LMS will support uh, uploading these big files. So I will figure it out that how to do it. And as soon as I find out, I will upload. Well, we can do on YouTube as well. Sure, we will see. <clears throat> okay, so, so usually the question that I ask is, what is a computer? Can anyone tell me what is a computer? Uh, it's an electronic device that takes an input and uh, processes and stores data. Yes, and it works in the binary form. Like it, it processes data in the binary form. So it's an electronic device. And it has input, it has output, and it processes, right? So is, is, is there any other definition? Or is there anyone who disagrees with it? <laughs> so there's a definition uh, it's a machine that processes and performs calculation. It's a machine that computes mathematical operations. Uh, it uses inputs to move from one state to the another. Yeah, so these are some of the definitions that you have written in chat. Um, okay, can, can, you def can you defend your statements? Can you tell me what, what do you mean by that? Can you tell me what does it mean by it's a machine that processes and performs calculation? Yes. And I'm especially interested. So there is this definition over here, which says that it is, no, not it is, it, it 
it uses. It uses inputs to move from one state to certain instruction. Okay, can you define it? What do you mean by that? <clears throat> Uh, sir, can I? Yeah, please, please go ahead. Um, sir, uh, we give instructions to the computer. Are mm -hmm. giving input means we we type something means we are giving input, sir, right? And we we ask it we ask the computer to perform uh, certain calcul calculations or certain whatever we want it to perform, and then it performs those calculations or whatever we want it to do, and then it uh, returns it back to us. Uh, we can see through the screen means it's giving output. Okay. So, <clears throat> okay, so yeah. So, so all the definition that I've received so far uh, have, um, they, are, they are a little bit biased, right? So biased in the sense that we already have been using computers all our lives. So we, we know that it's an electronic device, it has input, it's output, it processes, uh, but does it have to be an electronic device? Does it have to be an electronic device? Is it, it, is it necessary? I guess, I guess, yes, because it works with uh, zeros and ones. Uh, basically, it's, it's like the high signal and the low signal. So we need electricity for that. Does it have to use zeros and ones? Does it have to be electronic. What if I say that the answer to both these questions is no? So it doesn't have to use zeros and ones. It doesn't have to uh, be electronic. So there are examples in, in, in history uh, where there were computers which were not electronic, but mechanical. So uh, have you heard? Uh, yes, please. Uh, in pure theoretical terms, it is just a machine that takes a set of instructions and produces an output. Yes, uh, that, that's correct. Uh, yeah, but it doesn't have to be electronic, right? So yes. have you heard the name Charles Babbage? Yes, sir, founder of the computer. Yeah, so he he constructed the first computer, first mechanical computer. Okay. His me mechanical computer was called analytical engine. And his computer could add, multiply, subtract, divide, and do some simple arithmetic operation. So it's, 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 uh, it was a giant calculator kind of thing. And it could do a little few more things as well, but it was basically the analytical engine and uh, it, was, it was a computer. It was the first uh, computer, <clears throat> first mechanical computer. And I think it was some time, somewhere in 19th century uh, or maybe before that, uh, I don't remember the date, but uh, there, there was a computer. So it doesn't have to be electronic. It doesn't have to be uh, it doesn't have to use zeros and ones. Uh, so, so the modern computer that we use, they are electronic, right? They, they, they use elect electrical uh, devices in, inside it. Uh, they have electronics inside uh, and they work on zeros and one, but this is just one way of looking at, at the computer. Uh, you may say that this is the uh, topmost ev evolution of computers to a point that we are using uh, right now, but, but uh, it doesn't have to be. And, um, but the, the question still remains, what is, what is computer? So the, the answer to this question is, um, actually we do not have any answer to that question. So it's actually very difficult uh, to answer it. Uh, and the, there are many different uh, attempts to define what is a computer, but uh, all those definitions are not completely correct. 
there there are some flaws on, on in those definitions so so we we study computer science uh, but we still disagree on the definition of what is computer right but that's fine actually this is true for uh, most of the scientific uh, uh, theories and scientific endeavor so usually uh, people working in th those areas uh, differ and disagree on some basic and fundamental definition and that's this is perfectly perfectly fine so what is computer is a difficult question to answer and there are many different uh, interpretations and different definitions uh, some of them are better than the other but all of them have some some problems right uh, so rather than answering what is a computer what we do uh, we try to build or try to think about an idealized computer Okay, so we think about an idealized computer, which we call computational model. So this computation model is mostly theoretical. So it does not actually exist in reality. And uh, so we would say that, okay, so this is an idealized uh, system. Uh, if you want to call it a machine, that's perfectly fine. If you want to call it something else, that's also fine. But this idealized computer, um, is, is a machine or a construct which, which exists in theory. So it doesn't have a real machine or physical thing, uh, but it's just a mathematical model of what a computation could be. So we can, we can define what is computer as, it is a machine or it is something, it's a con construct that just do computation, right? So if something does computation, that thing could be called a computer. So rather than defining what is a computer, we can instead define what is computation. So what is computer turns into what is computation. Okay. So rather than solving uh, or answering the question that what is computer, we would try to answer what is computation because it's a little bit easier than answering what is computer. And we will see that still, again, not that easy. There are many difficulties, many, many problems in answering uh, such a question that what is computation? And we will see that those, what, what are those problems? And in, in, in order to answer this question, uh, we will come up with some idealized computer and that idealized computer will tell us that what is computation, right? And we will start from very basic uh, idealized computer and we will see that uh, is, it, is this basic model of computation uh, good enough that we can use it for to solve all computational problems. If yes, fine. If no, then we will see that what is the thing that we cannot compute. And then if, we, if there exists something that we cannot compute, can we increase the power of this idealized computer? And if, then we will see that yes, if we can do, then let's increase the power. And how can we increase the power? So if we increase the power, we, we receive a new idealized computer. And or let, let's forget about calling it idealized computer, we will say the next computational model. Then again, we will see that if this new computational model, uh, what is its capacity and power? Is there anything that it cannot do? And if there is nothing that it cannot do, then fine, we are done with that. But if there is anything that it cannot do, uh, try to figure out what is that it cannot do. And then we will see that, is there any other machine or we can improve the or, or improve this machine in such a way that it will start doing things that it was not able to do before. And this way we increase uh, our understanding of computation. So we start with a very basic computation model. Okay, and then we, we go all the way till a universal computational model. Okay. So the word universal here is, is, is a misleading <clears throat> uh, because I think we are very, I mean, egocentric and we think that whatever we do is, is universal uh, because we haven't found anyone else in the universe who can think, right? Uh, so this universal is, is misleading and we will, when we will talk about this universal model, uh, we will explore further that what does it mean. <clears throat> Uh, so how is it possible to come up with a design to do all the computation in the single design despite having a uh, limitation of resources? That's, that's a very good question and, uh, and we will see that it is possible. So 
this is possible due to two reasons. <clears throat> because when we say that we are trying to build a computational model and we are trying to answer what is computation, the answer to the, so, so basically we are, we are cheating. We are not giving the right answer uh, because we define computation as, so, so what we define, we define computer as something that computes. Then we define computation as that something that can be done by a computer. So it's, it's a cyclic definition. It's not a pure mathematical definition. And we do some little bit cheating and hand waving here and there. Uh, and, and, and since we have a very high opinion about ourselves, so we humans think that we are the masters of the universe. And since we haven't been able to find any alien civilization or anyone who can think uh, other than us, uh, so whatever we are doing is, is the universal thing. Whatever we are doing is the ultimate reality. So, so we are basically doing some hand waving over here, right? So yes, you are right. Uh, it's impossible for us to prove that what we are saying is the ultimate or universal computation model is indeed universal or the ultimate. It's, it's impossible for us. And, um, but at the same time, we are also limited by our, our understanding of nature, uh, understanding of laws of physics, understanding of math, which limits and hinders our intuition about computation. So, so whatever that we can think of, which could be computable, we already have captured. So if we say that this is beyond the realm of computation, it's because of either, it, it, it could be because of two things. Either uh, we are not able to understand uh, that how to attack that problem, or it is because uh, the mathematics and the laws of physics we have with us limit us to think in that direction. So. So this course is, is uh, it's very rigorous and theoretical, but it also has some philosophical aspects attached to it. So when you talk about computation, so this, this question here cannot be answered using just simple maths. So we need some philosophy and we will talk about philosophy and um, we will talk about, so we will talk about limitations and most of the, most of the time these limitations are, are theoretical and abstract. But hardware limitations are also important. For example, uh, let's say we know the size of the universe, right? Let's say we know the, the observable universe is like 93 billion light years in, in diameter. Um, and we, we have a rough estimate about the number of particles in the entire uh, observable universe, right? So if you assume that the, every particle that exists in universe is of one computer or one processor, and we can think about this processor as one of the fastest computer that we have available to us, right? So let's say every particle, every atom, every quark in this universe. So let's not, let's not go to the quark. Let's say every atom in this, this universe is one computer and it can do very fast computation. Even then we might not be able to solve certain problems because uh, those problems are so complicated that we cannot simply solve, right? And there are two questions again. So there are some problems which we cannot solve at all. And there are some problems which we can solve, but we do not have enough resources to solve. So we know how to solve, uh, but we do not have enough resources, enough power, enough energy, enough computational hardware available to us, which will enable us to solve. And at the same time, there are some problems, even with the infinite amount of resources, we will not be able to solve. So there, there's some distinction between uh, the physical limits and, and the abstract limits. And we will talk about those limits in, in, the, in this course. Maybe in, in, in third or fourth week, uh, we will actually go in, 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 in and, and see the, these limits. Okay. <clears throat> okay, so let's start with the most basic, most basic computation model. So, so the most basic computation model is a model, uh, which is basically a machine. And uh, so we have a machine, so let's call it a machine. And this machine computes two things. So whatever is the question, 
regardless what is the, is the question, it either gives yes or it gives no. Okay. So we have a machine. It's one of the most basic model of computation. And this machine only gives two kinds of answer. Sometimes it gives yes answer. Sometimes it gives no answer. So whenever we start the machine, this machine will give us a yes answer after some time or a no answer after some time. Okay. Uh, so for example, <coughs> so for example, uh, so we all know what are the binary states, right? Binary strings are those strings which are composed of zeros and ones. So for example, zero is a binary string, zero one is a binary string, one zero one is a binary string, and zero one zero 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 one one zero one zero is a binary string, and so on and so forth. All of these strings are binary strings, right? Right? So we know that we can think about these strings as numbers as as, as binary numbers, as numbers in uh, binary uh, binary system, right? So, <clears throat> so we know that this number zero represents zero. The zero one represents one, one zero one represents I think five and so on. So, so, so let's focus only on non-negative integers for now. So non-negative integers are called set of natural numbers and these set of natural numbers have numbers like zero, one, two, three, four, and so on, okay? So if you have non-negative integers, then for every non-negative integer that we have in the set, we can represent that non-negative integer using a, a binary string. So zero is zero, one is one, two is zero, one, three is uh, one, zero, Four is, oh, sorry. There's some mistake, sorry. I'm sorry for that. Two is um, one zero, three is one one, four is one zero zero, and so on and so forth, right? So this way we can define uh, these integers, these non-negative integers. But we know that all non-negative integers um, okay, so let, let's continue for two minutes and then we can have a, a break for 10 minutes, right? So <clears throat> all these non-negative integers are basically, can be characterized into two different classes. So we can characterize them in even class and odd class, right? So I, I believe that you are uh, familiar with um, uh, equivalence relations. And, and functions and other things from discrete mathematics. So we can have an equivalence relation over here and all the even numbers like zero and two and four and six and eight and so on can come in the class of even and the odd numbers like one, three, five, seven, nine and like that go to the odd class, right? Now, let's suppose since we are talking about the basic computation model and we say that this is the basic computational model. So it's, it's, it's a diagram uh, a block diagram of a basic computational model. So we say that we pass a number X. This number X belongs to the set of natural numbers, okay? And this machine is just checking one thing. It's checking is X even, okay? We know that the answer to this question is either yes or no, because we know that this X which is represented in binary, so X is represented in binary. So we have to figure out that when this X, which is represented in binary sent to this machine, what this machine tell us? And there's only one question this machine is asking right now. And that is, it says yes, or it says no, okay? If you want to simulate this thing, if you want to simulate this machine, you can simulate it using a Java function or C, C++ function or a Python function, right? I'm not sure which language you are more uh, comfortable with, all of you, but using any of these language, we can simulate this function, right? 
So if I call this machine M, then I can write a function M over here, uh, which returns bool and it takes X and X is a binary. So I'm using a mixture of all the languages and inside we check uh, if X is uh, even return true, else return false, right? So this is the function. So this is a higher level description of this function and even higher level of this description of this function is represented here in this block diagram. Okay, uh, I think we will stop here and uh, we can uh, stop here for 10 minutes. So let's come back at 7.40, all of us, and we will start fix uh, 7.40. So I will pause the recording and I will uh, stop sharing my screen. And one, I mean, the screen will be shared. So once you come back, we will start from the same point. Okay, so let's come back. Uh, at 7.40, okay? See you in 10 minutes. Hello everyone, welcome back. <clears throat> Are you all back? <clears throat> yes, sir. Okay, okay great. Yes, sir. So I've shared the screen and I've also <clears throat> resumed recording. Okay. <clears throat> So we were talking about the very basic and very simple uh, model of computation. In this model of computation, uh, we can imagine as, as a block which accepts some strings, some binary strings, which represent um, a natural number. And they answer this question, whether the input, the, the, the input that it receives is an even number or an odd. So if it is an even, it says yes. If it is not an even number, it says no, right? It's, it's a very simple basic, uh, basic thing. And, and, and I, I believe that all of you can write a program in Python or Java or C, C++ or any programming language, higher level programming language, which actually does this computation, right? So we can think about it as, as a very simple, basic uh, computational function, <laughs> right? <clears throat> okay. So we can, we can see that is, so what kind of basic computer it is, right? So we can ask other questions, for example. I would say that I have a box, I have a box here, and this box also receives some input X, and it tells, it gives us an output, either yes or no. But, and let, let's call it M here, right? And this, machine M is basically a machine, which is when you send, when, whenever X is a valid Java string, Java code, it gives Yes, <clears throat> otherwise it says no, okay? And one may ask what, what does it mean by a valid Java code, right? So you can think about it, this machine M is a compiler of Java, right?
Yes, we were, so there's there's a very good question that before programming languages, how were the simple machines designed? Uh, so I, I will come back to this question. Just give me a couple of minutes and I will come back to this question. So if I say that you have to construct such a machine M that does this job, uh, then actually what I'm asking you is to construct a compiler, right? a compiler which compiles the programs written in Java. So if, if you write a program in Java and that's a valid program in Java, then if you send that program to a machine, then it will, let's suppose that this compiler just checks if, if the, the code is correct, okay? It doesn't do anything else. It just checks the syntax and other semantic checks and, and, and so on. And it tells you that whether it is a valid Java program or it's not a valid Java program. So actually I'm, I'm asking you to write a parser or a compiler for Java line, right? Now we can think about the Java code that you have entered as X as a long string, right? So this Java code can be considered as a long string, right? <clears throat> this, it, it can be considered a long string of letters and numbers and special symbols and so on and so forth, right? So we know that in Java program, uh, we, we either have characters from small a to small z, right? We have capital A to capital Z or zero to nine. And uh, we also have um, open braces, closed braces and parentheses, closed parentheses, and some special symbols like plus, minus, multiplication, uh, division, uh, and uh, there are some other special operators or uh, special symbols that we use, and there are some other special things as well. So a Java program is made up of all these things, but so is a C program, so is a Python program, so is a program written in any, any, in any programming language, but a Java program is different from a Python program. A Python program is different from a C or C++ program, right? And this machine will only validate, it, it will only check whether this, this code, which is entered as a, as a long string of zeros and ones and A's and B's and C's and special symbols uh, is actually a valid Java program, right? So if, if I give a program written in Python, then it will say it's not a valid Java program, right? So if you use Python compiler or interpreter to interpret Java program, then it will say it will not compile. And the same thing the other way, right? So, so this is a limited machine. So we need to answer, we need to think about it. What is the relationship between this machine M and the previous machine M that was just checking whether the X was an even number or not, right? Is there any fundamental difference between the, these two things? Is, are these two machines computationally different? Is one machine more powerful than the other? Is it possible to utilize the power of this powerful machine to do the computation required by the first problem? Is it possible to utilize the first machine to answer the second question or not? Is, is there anything else that we can answer with this machine? Or what is the most complicated question that we can ask? What is the simplest question that we can ask? Okay, so these are the things that we will uh, do in this course, right? So we will start from a very basic model and go all the way till uh, the most complicated uh, machine. And if I say that this machine M here is a representation of, a, of the most advanced or universal computation model, then I would not be wrong because Java is a programming language and you can write anything in Java. Whatever that you can think to compute, you can compute in Java, right? In fact, you can write this whole machine in Java because the Java compiler can be rewritten in Java itself, right? And that compiler would be powerful enough to write another Java compiler, right? So it's, it's a very recursive thing. So you can use a C++ compiler to write a C++ compiler or a Java compiler or a Python compiler. And the same thing can be done with a Java program. So with the Java program, you can use Java language to write a compiler for Java or C or C++ or Python or any other programming language that exists now, or you can create your own programming. So these are very powerful computers. So what so because we use these programming languages to program anything uh, that we can imagine or think about. And not only that, we can also write compilers for these, uh, these languages 
which can compute anything that we can think of. So these languages are very powerful languages. These are, these are a model of computation which we would, we would assume or imagine that this is the most powerful kind of uh, computation model, right? But this is very abstract. Uh, we, will, we will try, we will look at uh, this kind of model. Um, and this model is usually called a RAM model. We will see what is RAM, uh, but maybe we will not discuss in detail what is RAM model. And instead we would discuss another model, which is called Turing model or Turing machine. I believe all of you are familiar with uh, the name Turing, uh, but it doesn't matter if you do not know what is Turing machine, we will uh, see in detail that what the Turing machine. <clears throat> So Turing machine is, is a more abstract um, way of, of, of computing. It's, it's a very mathematical and a very abstract uh, way of computation. And this is the most uh, powerful computation model that we know. And later on, we see that uh, Turing machine is not the only computation model that we know. In fact, there are any, many other computation models which are as powerful as Turing machines. And uh, so it doesn't matter if you use one model or the other, as long as they are compatible, uh, that's fine. <clears throat> so yeah, what is RAM? So, so RAM is basically a random access machine. Okay. So Turing machines were designed and constructed by Alan Turing. RAM machines were defined and constructed and popularized by um, von Neumann. Okay. So maybe you have heard his name as well. Von Neumann was a mathematician, an electrician, uh, electrical engineer, and uh, computer scientist. He, he was many other things as well. Uh, so von Neumann is uh, attributed with RAM machine. So RAM machine is, is closer um, to our modern computers like laptops and, and, and PCs. Um, so they are, they are very close to that, okay? Uh, but Turing machine is more mathematical, more abstract, and it's enough if, if you use this one or that one, uh, they are interchangeable. <clears throat> so whatever that you can do with one machine, one model, uh, you can do with the other as well. And whatever that you cannot do with one, you cannot do with the other. And that is one of the major milestone in this course uh, which we will talk about in detail, uh, which is called Church Turing Thesis. So Church was um, Ellen Turing's PhD advisor when Ellen Turing was a student in Princeton University in uh, 30s and 40s. Uh, so Church was doing his work, and Turing was doing his work, and they independently come up with some uh, certain computational models in 1930s and 40s. And later on, they showed, and other people also showed that these models are compatible. So it doesn't matter if you, if you go with the church model or Turing model, uh, they are both the same. So <clears throat> anyway, we will, we will talk about church Turing thesis uh, in detail in, in later uh, classes. Uh, so far, I will stop at this point and I will wait for your questions and then I will start uh, some formal comments. <clears throat> so, so far we still had introduction. Yes, any questions? Oh, sorry. So there was a question which I forgot to answer. So before programming languages, how were these simple machines designed? Uh, actually, we do not need programming languages to design these machines. So programming languages are basically a manifestation of our understanding of these abstract models. So mathematicians and computer scientists such as Church and Turing and von Neumann and, and other people who were working in those times uh, were thinking about computation from a very formal mathematical point of view. So they devised these ideas and, and with these ideas, modern computers came into existence. And with these modern computers, uh, programming languages emerged in 60s and 50s and 60s. So these programming languages are basically the manifestation of these abstract computational models. So it's the other way. <clears throat> okay. So first came these models, mathematical models, then came uh, the programming languages. And once we have programming languages, 
because they are so intuitive and so easy for us because we are so used to these programming languages, at least in computer science departments, uh, because we all do programming and we all study uh, from uh, semester one. Uh, so it, it seems second nature to us. Therefore, it's easier for us to uh, think about these machines from the point of view of programming. But the actual chronological order is the uh, abstract mathematical ideas before we came to the language. <clears throat> Okay, is the implementation of Turing machine model of computation dependent on hardware? Uh, can it be implemented in machine, um, mechanical machines too? Yes, uh, Turing machine is an abstract model. It's a mathematical model. And Turing machine is one of the most, comp uh, I mean, powerful model of computation that we will study in this course. And before that, we will study at least a couple more models, which are basic and simpler. Uh, so when we will come to Turing machine, I will show you that how Alan Turing came up with this idea and his idea does not require any hardware actually. So all you need is a mathematician or a person. And uh, so it's basically simulates a mathematician sitting in a room with an infinite supply of, of, of uh, paper and infinite supply of, of pencils. So as long as you are allowed to write uh, on infinite supply of paper, for example, if, if your supply does not finish, uh, you always have new things to write and you always have resources to write with, uh, then you can perform computation. So Alan Turing's idea was to simulate such a behavior of a mathematician uh, as a machine. So it's, it's a very mathematical idea. It doesn't require any hardware. And uh, when we will come to that point, we will, uh, I would explain more. And, and by that time, you will have a pretty much a good idea about that, how it works. Yes, any other questions? Okay, no questions, fine. Uh, <clears throat> so, uh, so, so far we have talked about so many things here and there, right? So it, it seems that we, we have been talking about a lot of things which are, uh, which might not be connected to uh, each other or if they are connected, they are very vaguely discussed and, and so on. So let us begin this course with a very formal, uh, uh, I mean, <clears throat> with, with a very formal idea. So the very formal, the first formal ideas that we start with is the, the concept of a string. Okay. So we are all familiar with what is a string and that string is coming from programming languages. Uh, but I would ask you to uh, forget about that idea for some time and uh, we will redefine what is a string. Okay. And later on, you will see that this definition of string that I will give you now uh, is very similar to the one that you already know from programming languages, but in fact, it is more robust and, and, and more powerful, right? So you can replace the definition that you get uh, about strings in programming languages by the string definition that we will do, here, right? So the very first concept that we will study is the concept of a string, okay? And strings are the fundamental building blocks in any uh, model of computation. So they are the fundamental building blocks. Okay? So I already talked about a string when we talked about the binary representation of the natural numbers. So let me extend that what is a string. Okay? So before we go and define what is a string, we define an alphabet. So we define an alphabet. Okay? And what is an alphabet? Alphabet is, is, a, is a set so it is a set, a fundamental set of fundamental characters, okay? which we call symbols. Okay? Usually an alphabet is represented as the capital sigma or capital gamma. Okay? So this is sigma and this is gamma. And most of the time, since you have to work with your problem sets and submit the problem set solution with, the, with LaTeX, so I, I believe that all of you are familiar with LaTeX, right? Are you all familiar with LaTeX? And you have access to LaTeX? Yes, no, sir. Uh, so if yes, that's perfectly fine. If no, then I would say that please get some refresher and, and see that uh, how LaTeX works, right? So in LaTeX, for example, 
Uh, this capital sigma is written as slash capital S S I M A, and this gamma is written as slash capital G M A M M A. Right. So these are the. Can you please for explain latex again? Uh, latex is is a document preparation system. It's a text processor. So what happens is that you write your document, okay, with .tex extension, which is a text file basically, and you give it to a LaTeX compiler. So it's basically a code, code written in LaTeX format, and it produces PDF. So, so the document that I showed uh, for the syllabus uh, was, it, was written in LaTeX, so it's a PDF. So you will learn it, and if not, then I have some uh, workshop um, slides and I will sh share with you some resources, so uh, stay tuned. Anyway, <clears throat> so let's come back to our discussion about alphabet. So what is an alphabet? Alphabet is the set of basic uh, building blocks, which we call symbols or characters, and it is represented as capital sigma or sometimes with capital gamma and sometimes with both. Okay? Uh, so this is the representation. So we say that in a string, sorry, a string over an alphabet okay, is a finite it is important. This finite thing is important. Okay, it's a finite sequence from the alphabet. Okay, and furthermore, this alphabet is also finite and fixed. It cannot be infinite. It cannot be variable. Right. So it has to be finite. This has to be fixed. So let's take a concrete example. Let's say I tell you that my sigma contains three letters, A, B, and C, okay? Now I say that S is a string over sigma, which means that S is composed of these three characters, right? So S, for example, if I say that S is A, B, B, C, and W is a string that is um, C, C, A, B, and so on. So these are all the strings composed of characters that we get from the set alphabet. So this alphabet is a set, okay? And all properties of set that you know from discrete maths apply here. And this set is not an infinite set. This is a finite set. This is a fixed set. And since it's a set, so there is no order among the members of this, this set. So they are all characters. They are all members of this character. So we say that A belongs to sigma, B belongs to sigma, C belongs to sigma and so on, right? Is this in clear? Yes, sir. Okay, so as, as another concrete example, I can define, let's say I have another alphabet, let's call it sigma one. And I say that sigma one contains two characters, zero and one, right? So any string over sigma one, would be basically a binary string, right? So because this, any string that we form using the characters of sigma, sigma one alphabet would be composed of either all zeros or all ones or some zeros and some ones in any particular order, right? So zero is a string, one is a string, zero one is a string, one zero is a string, one 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 is a string, one zero one zero one zero is a string and so on and so forth all those strings which are defined over this alphabet are basically the binary string, right? So we can say that this is, this alphabet, which is zero one, defines binary string. So we can define different binary strings using the characters or using the symbols of this alphabet. Okay, uh, so there's some question. Yes, uh, Shariar, what is the question? Maybe it's not a question. I'm not sure. 
Okay, fine. Uh, that's perfectly okay. <clears throat> so we say that let's suppose we have some alphabet and we have some W. And this W is a string over sigma. Okay. Then we define the length of W as the number of symbols in W. Okay. So for example, if I define my sigma as, let's say, uh, A, B, C, and D, and I say my W is basically A, B, A, B, C, C, D, then length of this W is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So this seven characters is the length. Right, very simple concept. Okay, now if a string W has length zero, then W is called an empty string. Okay, it is called an empty string. Yeah. So empty string is string that contains no symbols, zero symbols. So a string is not a set, a string is a sequence. Okay, so you need to understand the difference between a set and a sequence. Okay, a set is a collection of objects where order is not important. A sequence is a collection of objects where order is important. Right? So a, a string is a sequence while an alphabet is a set. Clear? Okay. So if a string W has a length zero, then W is called an empty string. And usually an empty string is represent, represented as an epsilon. Okay. It is represented as an epsilon. Uh, some authors represent it as lambda. Uh, but we would mostly use it as epsilon. Okay. Suppose if W has length n. Okay. So we can write, we can write W as, let's say, uh, some character uh, C1 or C2, C3, Cn, such that all Ci belongs to the sigma. So this W has a length n, so this W is over sigma, okay? Is this thing clear? Okay, so if W is a string, then we say W reverse is another string, which is basically the reverse of the string W. So if W is basically C1, C2, all the way till Cn, then W reverse is basically Cn, Cn minus one, all the way till C1. It's just a reverse, right? Suppose I have an alphabet, which is zero and one, and I say that W is basically zero, one, one, zero, zero, one, then W reverse would be one, zero, zero, one, one, zero. Right? So we say that if a string W is same as its reverse, then W is called a palindrome. For example, in this particular case, if W is 101, then we know that W reverse is also 101. So in this case, this 101 is a, is a palindrome. So if a string is same as its reverse, or if you re start reading it from left to right or right to left, uh, if it reads the same, then it is called a palindrome. Is this unclear? Yes, sir. Uh, sigma is not a standard set. We will define the sigma according to what we want to define. 
Sometimes you would have a zero and one in sigma. Sometimes you would have ABC. So whatever is the sigma, all the strings that we will define over that sigma will reflect the symbols from the sigma. So for different problems, we will have different sigmas. Okay, but some uh, sigmas are very common, like sigma with, that contains zero one. Sigma that contains just A or the sigma that contains AB or ABC and so on, or sigma that contains a zero, one, and two, and sigma that contains maybe plus and minuses. So, so sigma could be anything. But whatever is the sigma, all the string will correspond to that sigma. Okay. So we say that a string Z is called a substring of another string W if the Z appears consecutively within W, okay? For example, if I have a long string like 0, 1, 1, 0, uh, 1, 1, 0, 0, 1, then, uh, one zero one is a substring. So suppose this is W, then and say Z one, then Z one is a substring. Z one is a substring. So it has to appear consecutive, right? Suppose Z two is a zero one one again, it's a substring. Z two is a substring. Okay. Now suppose I have Z three, which is zero zero zero, then Z three is not a substring. substring of W, okay? So Z3 is not a substring of W, while Z1 is a substring, Z2 is a substring. Uh, no, strings are not subset of sigma, no. Uh, if it is an empty string, we'll call, uh, we'll calling it null would be the same thing. Uh, well, of course, if you want to call it null, it's fine, but uh, in automated theory and in theoretical physical science, we call it empty string. So we will just simply say lambda or epsilon rather than calling it null string. Uh, if you want to call it fine, that's perfectly fine, but uh, usually this is not what we say. So uh, strings are not subset of sigma for sure. Why? Can anyone tell me why? Let's suppose I have a sigma that contains zero one and I have a string S that is zero one zero zero one. Is S a subset of sigma? No. No, sir. Why? Because, it, because it's not a set. S is not a set. Okay. S is not a set. This is the reason that S is not set. So it's not basically uh, a subset. Fine. Is everything clear so far? Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, at any time, if you feel any difficulty, just let me know. Right now, it's, it's just a preliminary. Uh, stuff, uh, which is important for us to know before we go and define our first uh, competition model, right? Okay. So for example, if uh, we have two strings, X and Y, okay, if N, X, X and Y are strings uh, and forget about what is the alphabet, there is some alphabet and strings of length, uh, let's say N and M. That is the length of X is M, uh, length of X is N, length of y is n, okay? Sorry, should be the other way. I'm always confused, okay. So suppose x is of length m and y is, is, is of length n. So if it is length m and it is length n, we can write that x must contain m symbols. And we do not know what are those symbols. So let's say it contains X1, X2, all the way till XM symbols. And Y contains N symbols, so we do not know what symbols. Uh, so let's say they are both coming from the same alphabet. So it's Y1, Y2, all the way till Y. Okay. Then we can define, we can define concatenation of X and Y. 
Okay, we write concatenation of two strings as x concatenated y, or sometimes we just write x y. Okay, the concatenation of string x and y is basically all the symbols of x, x1, x2, all the way till xm, then all the symbols of y, y1, y2, y3, all the way to y. Okay, as an example, suppose our alphabet contains uh, zero and one, okay, x is equal to zero, one, one, zero, and y is equal to one, 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 zero. Then x, y must be equal to zero, one, one, zero, uh, one, 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 zero. Okay, so since the length, <clears throat> So, so over here, uh, the length of the length of x is equal to four, and length of y is equal to five. So the length of x y must be equal to nine. So we can count one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Okay, so you can call it a new string. Let's say this is z. Then we know that the length of z is length of x y, which is equal to. Is this thing clear? Okay. Okay. Now suppose there is a string. Um, it, it could be any alphabet. Let's say I have a string X, uh, which is just zeros, zero, 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 zero. Okay. Or maybe another string, depending on whatever is the alphabet. Uh, suppose I have a string um, W, which is just W1, 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 and so on. Right? It's the same symbol that appears again and again. It's either all zeros or ones or one of the symbols from set, right? Uh, but we know that there are K copies, okay? In that case, we would say that this W1, K, okay? Or in this particular case, we can say that it is zero power five, right? So we would write the symbol and we write F, uh, this five as an exponent to indicate that we have these many copies of the symbol, right? Suppose we have the alphabet, which is zero and one. And I say that I have a string W, uh, which is one, zero, exponent three, one, exponent five, and zero, uh, let's say exponent two. So what is this string? This is string W is basically one, followed by three zeros, then followed by five ones, then followed by two zeros. So I could write either write this string this way, or I can write it this way. It's the same thing. Okay. Okay. Sometimes uh, we have alphabet that contains English characters. For example, you can have an alphabet that contains, let's say, A, B, and all the way till Z. And then if you form the strings from this alphabet, then all those strings are basically the strings of English language, right? They may make sense, they may not make any sense, right? So if you have a lot of the strings, for example, uh, AB is a string, uh, CAB is a string, and FLY is a string and so on, all these strings are there, right? So whenever you have a lot of strings, <clears throat> and if you, order these strings in some particular order and one of the particular order that we are interested in or which is important is called lexicographic order. So lexicographic order is basically the dictionary order. Okay, so the string that uh, starts with A comes before the string that starts with B that comes before the string that starts with C and so on and so forth. Okay. So lexical order graph, uh, lexicographic ordering is basically just an ordering mechanism that if you have many strings written or you are using many different string at the same time, uh, then let's find some order, right? So that, that is called lexicographic order. But you can, you can think about any particular order that you want. Uh, it could be ascending order or, or strings could be ordered in terms of the size, that is the length of the symbols, length of the characters used, 
or it could be anything. Okay? Any order could be different. But lexicographic order is one order. Yes, we have one uh, hand raised, Mars. What's your uh, question? Sir, I wanted to, I wanted to ask that uh, are empty strings automatically assumed to be present in every uh, sigma or alphabet set? Uh, alphabet does not contain strings. Alphabet contains the building blocks of the string. Right? So you have okay. to separate these things. Alphabet is a set. The string is a sequence. Alphabet contains um, the building blocks of uh, building blocks of of the string, and these are the characters or the symbols which make up the string. Okay, does that answer your question? Yes, sir. Okay, uh, a couple of more de definitions, and then I think we will be done with this. And uh, we say that. Sure. Um yes I, I just have one question uh, sure. for example if our alphabet is a b and c so will the empty string be considered as a sequence that can be formed using this alphabet a b and c and let's say i have an empty string right so empty string is a string okay an empty string is a string over any alphabet Okay, yeah, that's exactly yeah. what I was asking. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so empty string is formed by combining zero symbols. So if you say that I don't take any symbols, then it doesn't matter what is the alphabet, right? So empty string is, is over any uh, alphabet. Okay, does that answer your question? Yes, sir, Thank you. Okay, great. Uh, so suppose I have a string X. <clears throat> And it doesn't matter what is the alphabet, it could be anything, we are not uh, interested right now. Uh, suppose X is a string, okay? So we would call this X a prefix of some string Y, okay? If there exists a string exists where X, Z is equal to Y. Is this thing clear? It's a little bit uh, convoluted. It's not difficult. It, it's a little bit convoluted. And when I will give you example, you will understand that what I'm trying to say. A prefix means exactly what you understand by a prefix. Uh, the meaning of prefix is coming from the English language. Over here, we are just giving a mathematical definition of prefix in terms or in context of um, strings. So it says that if X is a string, then we would call this X a prefix of another string Y. If there exists a string Z, such that X, Z is equal to Y. Um, sir, can okay. Z be an empty string over here? That's a very good question. And yes, it could be an empty string. It could be an empty string because we did not qualify what Z is, then it is possible that Z is an empty string. So let me give, uh, a non-trivial example first, and then I will give you a trivial example, okay? Uh, suppose I have a string 0, 1, 1, 1. Okay, 0, 1, 1, 1. Suppose this is equal, this is string y. And I say that x is 0 and z is 1, 1, 1, then y is 0, 1, 1, 1, right? So this x is a prefix of 0, 1, 1, 1. And that's, that's for sure, because zero appears as a prefix of the entire string, right? So zero is a prefix. Yes. So you can say that, suppose y is zero, one, 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 and you have another string, let's say, let, let's call it x1, let's say x2 is a string that is zero, one. So then zero, one is also, zero, one is also a prefix of y because there exists a string z, Let's call it Z and Z2, uh, which is equal to 1, 1, right? So if you concatenate 1, 1 with 0, 1 in front of 0, 1, then you will get Y, the original string. And since such a string exists, therefore, X1 is a prefix, X2 is a prefix, right? You can come up with more, right? So you can say that X3 is 0, 1, 1, 
three characters. So in this case, you even in this case, you can have a Z, which is just one, right? And somebody would say as, as, as a non-trivial example, uh, sorry, as a trivial example, let's say, say X4 is 0111. In this particular case, Z4 must be empty, right? Therefore, every string is a prefix of itself. Right? Every string is a prefix of itself. Therefore, we define not just prefix, but we also define proper prefix. So this trivial example is not a proper, not a proper prefix, but these are proper prefixes. This concept is, is very similar to the, the concept of subsets and proper subsets. Do you remember the concepts of subsets and proper subsets? Every set is a subset of itself. Right? But just a subset, not a proper subset. Yes, every string is a prefix of itself. And if a prefix is not same as the string itself, then in that case, we call it a proper prefix. Otherwise it's just a prefix. Clear? Anything, any question, any difficulty? Uh, sir? Yes. Uh, I just wanted to ask that, can X be an alphabet instead of a string? I do not understand this part. What do you mean by an alphabet? Alphabet is just a building block, right? It's a character. Okay, but can we say that a, a string of length one, can mm -hmm. that be con con concatenated with an empty string? Of course it can be. So for example, uh, that, that's a very good question. Suppose sigma is zero one, okay? There are two symbols in, in zero. So zero is a string, okay? Zero is a string, one is a string. Zero, zero is a string, zero, one is a string, one, one is a string, zero, one, zero, one is a string, and so on. So all of these are string, including empty string. So these are all a string because all of them are sequences. This is a sequence of no characters. This is a sequence of just one character. This is a sequence of one character. This is a sequence of two characters, all of them. And this is a sequence of four characters. So a, a string is a sequence. It doesn't matter if it is a sequence of one character or zero character. So when you are using the character, that becomes a string. But when the character is inside the set, it's a member, it's just a character. And a collection of characters is basically called an alphabet, right? So an alphabet is a set and a sequence is, is a, and a string is a sequence, right? So alphabet is a set, string, is a sequence. So why, what is the difference between a set and a, uh, and a sequence? In a set, order does not matter, while a sequence order does matter. Okay, uh, sure. and if, you, if, you, if you are coming from Java or C++, uh, there is a distinction between a character and a string. For example, in Java, I can say that, uh, let's say A is equal to, uh, in small quotes, A, okay? And I say that B is in double quotes, A. Do you know the difference between single quotes and double quotes in Java or C++? That this is just a character and this is yes, a so. string, right? So, so in, in automata theory, we do not make such distinctions. A string could be a string of one character or it could be a string of two characters or more, or it could be a string of zero characters. So when we consider a string, it's a sequence of characters, zero or one or more characters. That is a string, it's a sequence. An alphabet is basically a set of all the building blocks which you can use to construct your string. You see the difference? Yes, sir, I understand it. Uh, I, I just have Great. one more thing I wanted to ask. Uh, sure. And that is that 
कैन यू से दैट द सेट कैन कैन यू से दैट द अल्फाबेट सेट इज मेड अप ऑफ स्ट्रिंग्स ऑफ लेंथ वन वेल वी कैन से इट बट वी शुड नॉट से इट बिकॉज an alphabet has as a has a, a proper meaning in in mathematics right uh so what you are saying is okay uh but it's not proper from a theoretical point of view if you want to understand it this way that's fine uh but yeah uh class time has ended is it is it the case i think class will last till 8:45 right Oh, eight twenty-five. Okay. Okay. In that case, we are done with the class. So thank you very much. And uh, if you want to stay because you have some questions, that's perfectly fine. Uh, I will answer your questions. Otherwise, uh, you are free to go. And I will yeah, find a I... way to upload these uh, notes and videos. And uh, yes, please. Sir, I just want to request you to upload the uh, course description that you showed us at the start of the class. Uh, if you can upload it on LMS, that would be great. Secondly, I wanted to ask: uh, Is it necessary to upload our solutions in LaTeX to our problem solvers? Uh, sorry, to the problem set, or can we upload these scanned images? Why not? Why not? Uh, I feel like at times it uh, it can be a problem because LaTeX does take a lot of time. So no, like, it doesn't. Uh, it, yeah, I I agree. I agree. Uh, I agree, and. Um, Uh, this is an apprehension by some students that they uh, i mean they think that latex is difficult complicated they can run into problems uh, all of that is true it is possible that you will run into problems but uh, but believe me if you master it now uh, then you will never go back to any other word processing software so when I, when i was at habib and uh, we use latex from the first semester so we we force students in first semester to use latex and by the time they are in second third fourth semester they are very fluent um, so they create their homework and assignments and quizzes and exams and posters and presentations and and all documentations in in latex uh, so you will become fluent so this is a high time uh, that you would learn and and i, I know that if, if if you don't make it mandatory then probably you will not uh, i mean you will not have a motivation to learn it uh, but uh, of course if you have difficulty then uh we can come up with a different alternate solution but i would i would say that please give it a try and if you have if you do not know latex please learn it and it will definitely help you in many things especially if you are going for a graduate degree it will definitely help you and if you have any problem with latex let's just let me know and i will i can i can conduct a tutorial uh, for you on on latex that how to work with it okay sir thank you okay uh thank you very much uh thank you uh for first class was wonderful uh please sir let me know if you have any any uh, issues or problem yes yes please go ahead sir i have a request yes if you could upload the recording of this first lecture mm -hmm. and then yes I, i i will do it i will do it so uh, let me figure out that how to do it uh and once i find it out then i will i will do it so maybe it will take a couple of days um, but i will do it as soon as possible i will try to upload the lecture that we have uh, what have whatever that i have written over here uh immediately and uh, maybe usually i i uh, form these as week wise but i think it, it's better to do it class wise so i will upload all the lecture notes on lms as soon as we are done and i will also upload the syllabus and description and other things okay thank you very much all right it was really thank nice you. teaching uh, i think it was my first experience teaching at idea students so so far so good uh, do let me know if you have uh, any any anything that you would like me to do uh, if you are comfortable or with the pace or anything just let me know. you can send me an email anytime Okay see you next uh, next time uh, on Thursday bye till then uh, stay safe stay positive take care of yourself and khuda